it's it's I mean I hope it pushes us so and when when in the short term in the long run just in the renewables and yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wouldn't yeah. it be nice yeah, 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 yeah. just to push it again with the electric cars as well yeah exactly it's next to push isn't it? yeah it could go either way though couldn't it because it was so desperate to well, go we're desperate we're going to we're, 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 we're going to uh, we're yeah. going to Saudi and saying oh, I know, know, right? but, can yeah. people here at home <laughs> I've, just, I've just unmuted, so they should. Hello? Anyone? Yes, I think so. Yes, people can hear. Brilliant. Okay. Who's <laughs> at home? Um, <laughs> we have five people. Is it, is it straightforward? Because we've got to do this on Thursday. Um, well, so the way I do it, well, I've had, hello, come on in, have, take a seat. Um, the way I do it, because we had a Zoom bomb a while ago, and it was, it was, a, it was a nightmare, uh, I put a waiting room on, which means I want a second laptop so that I can add people in the waiting room, um, which I will do now. Uh, so, so what I do is I log in with my home, my, my normal Zoom account here, and I log in with my university Zoom account on the laptop. I host the thing on, the, I host the, the, the meeting on the laptop and record it on the laptop, but then join from my other account on this. So if you've got other people who are willing to co-host, you presumably don't need to do that. Yeah, no, I've got a co-host. So yeah, that, that, that would make it easier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and Beth has said she can email me the talk. So it can be run from a uni computer off and run laptop. That's really good. So, so basically, I think all we have to do is just log into Zoom in the session. Yeah. Right, let's log into Zoom. Yeah. 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 Is that meeting house? No, because they don't have those facilities in the meeting house. It would be much nicer if it was. Um, and I'm, I want to explore what It'll the It'll be an email. It's in 1B, 1B3. Where we're okay. Yeah. So it's it's nice it's a nice enough room, so it's not going to come. Um, but we need we need this sort of little equipment to install the meeting house, which is what I have. No. Do come on both things. So. Yeah, I was planning to come. Drum up the ball. Yeah. Get the habit of coming into uni again. It's a bit neuro though. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to walk past the Talking about responsible things should we be having a, um, a meeting, Chris. Uh, um, yeah, your yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I think we should yeah. Hello. So let's just make just a start. So it's uh, it's my. Great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Zoltan Dienz. Is that the right way to pronounce it? DNS. DNS? Like the letters DNS. Oh, DNS. Yeah. I did not know that. Um, who's going to be giving us a, a talk on his work on uh, phenomenological control? So over to you, Zoltan. Thanks. So, what I'd like to describe is an ability many people have. 90% um, of people have it to, to some extent, and some people have it to a greater extent, normally distributed. Um, which I think is often missed in psychology generally. And so what I want to present is the case for its, its relevance to um, psychological experiments, uh, but also to everyday life and understanding people's experiences in everyday life. So what people can do is construct a counterfactual state of affairs in the world and then treat it as real. But it doesn't appear to them that they're doing this. It just appears that the experience is presenting reality objectively. And the, in a way, the point of the, 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 the skill or the experience is, is to not make it seem to you that you're making the experience, but the experience comes to you from without. Uh, in order to satisfy your goals and needs, um, but without you know that you're thereby satisfying your goals and needs. So it's sort of an act of self-deception. And that's why it's tricky, and that's why I think it's often been missed. But there are some uh, simple experiences almost everyone can have that illustrate it. For example, magnetic hands. If you imagine your hands are like magnets, um, you can feel a force 
a lot of people can anyway, like I am now, I feel a force pulling my hands together. And it seems to me there's a force pulling my hands together, and it doesn't seem to me that it's me doing it, but it is me doing it, of course. It's just a little bit of self-deception that I've carried out on myself. So the, um, the way these experiences can manifest is in motor movements, and they can be large or small, depending on degree of, degree of ability, that appear to be happening involuntarily from your perspective. So you, you might say the spirit is possessing me and making it happen, or the hypnotist is making it happen, or there's a bit of my brain making it happen, something like that. There's some other cause than yourself. But you can also um, imagine perceptual things and not seem to you imagining it, so experience it as hallucination. Or you can engage in pretense, but not know that you're pretending something, so it appears to you as belief. So, for example, people can come to believe they're uh, of the opposite gender or have a different identity uh, and so on. So these are the experiences that people can create and they can sustain over at least minutes, despite uh, conflicting evidence, uh, and have a sense of the reality of the experience. Uh, so I call this the capacity for phenomenological control. Now it's um, been known for a long time and it's normally called hypnosis, hypnotic suggestion. And that's the context in which within our culture, most people have come across these sorts of effects. But so there's a lot of mythology associated with hypnosis. Uh, and uh, I think it's time we we sort of junk some of that mythology by, by describing it in, in more adequate terms. For example, hypnosis is the Greek word for sleep. And that came about in um, 18, about 1840, when James Braid thought that hypnosis was a sleep-like state of the brain um, produced by sustaining attention for a long time, by uh, inhibiting the brain so that it became more suggestible. He actually gave up this theory later on, but the name neurohypnosis or hypnosis starting has been with us ever since. We know that um, hypnotic phenomena has nothing to do with sleep whatsoever. So the words are misnomer to begin with. And even then the notion that there's a special state that needs to be induced that comes with the notion of, of hypnosis is highly debatable and not one I personally subscribe to. Um, in fact, it's not just a matter of me not personally subscribing to it, but any suggestion that can be passed uh, with a hypnotic induction can be passed without hypnotic induction. It's just not necessary to engage in the inductions to get the effects. There's some, there's some debate maybe whether induction increases performance by a small amount, um, and maybe it does, but that could be explained just by pumping expectations because the subject expects to respond better after having received the induction. The other thing about um, sort of the hypnotic terminology is often referred to as suggestibility. We measure subject suggestibility. I find this slightly insulting to my subjects because I, I see it as a, um, it's not me manipulating them or the hypnotist manipulating them or anyone manipulating to do something against their better judgment, which is the implication of the term suggestibility. In fact, all the evidence shows that the, that, um, the responses subjects construct themselves are to fit their goals and needs. And if it didn't fit the goals and needs, they wouldn't engage in them. So the word suggestion, I find okay, because it's, uh, I can suggest something to you, make a suggestion and you can, you can respond to it and there's nothing insulting or, uh, um, um, misleading about describing in that way, but suggestibility. So suggestibility scales, no hypnotizability scales, no implies something to do with sleep. So you could say um, this is a, sort of a branding, a rebranding exercise, but I think rebranding is important um, for when you change the name of something, it can change how people think about things and, and realize its uh, relevance more generally. And that's what I want to show. So now to measure phenomenological control, um, really what you have to do, because the predictors of it that are not phenomenological control are very hard to find. It's very hard to know whether a person has high capacity in this regard or not without actually taking them through, say, 10, 10 suggestions and seeing how many of them they, they find subjectively compelling. So we have over the, um, 
decades of Sussex been um, producing scales, first of all, within the hypnotic tradition. So we had the Sussex Waterloo uh, suggestibility scale, which used a hypnotic induction, um, as I describe here. Um, so, for example, on a rising hand or a falling hand, your hand is getting so heavy it's falling, your hand is getting light, it's rising. Um, you might people will be given the suggestion and then rate did they move the hand more than six inches or give a subjective scale um, on a scale from zero to five how strongly did you feel your hand becoming heavy then what we did a couple of years back um, ryan ran in, um, in in his first first year practical class so he could screen up to 500 subjects uh, at a time is we um, sort of want to rationalize the procedure, take out everything, including the induction we thought was not necessary, remove references to hypnosis and the mythological, therefore, hopefully, to some extent, the mythological beliefs that people have about it, that they come to the screening session with, and just refer to it as a set, we're going to present you with a set of imaginative exercises. We'll shortly be giving some exercises in the use of your imagination to create certain experiences. The aim is to see how much you can control the way you experience some simple events, such as moving your hand. So it's presented as a skill. It is a skill in creating an experience. And it, the experience is an experience of involuntariness. So it is a strange sort of skill, right? Still, we presented it to subjects the way we believed it actually is. We wanted to see what they would make of that. And um, in this a couple of years back, um, this is a distribution of scores on the, on the zero to five subjective scale, where on average over 10 suggestions, subjects are saying, I experienced nothing, um, or five, it was as real as real. It was really like there was a heavy ball in my hand, pulling my hand down, or I really perceived the mosquito or the music that, I, that was um, suggested to me. What you get is a roughly normal distribution. This is the hypnosis scale with the hypnotic induction presented as a hypnotic screening. And this is presented as phenomenological control as a series as of uh, imaginative exercises. Now, in fact, the distribution is neater with a phenomenological control scale, it's more normal. And um, it has a higher mean score. And it seems to be what's happening. And this is not what we predicted. Um, that the low end here has been pushed up in the phenomenological control. So I think what happens in hypnosis, you can get some reactants. People say, you're not going to control me, mate. Uh, and that's because of the way, hip, you know, part of the mythology of hypnosis is someone takes over your mind, maybe weak minded people hypnotic. When you present it as a skill, you don't need to worry about these issues now. This is up to you. Can you create the experiences or not? So we now have a phenomenological control scale it takes about 40 minutes or so to uh, run. Um, we do need to give about 10 suggestions to get good reliability, uh, say 0.7 uh, convex alpha, in order to have good predictive value. Some people have asked me if they could use a shorter scale for the experiment because, you know, there's not much time. Uh, we have tried four suggestion items, but that has a reliability of about 0.4, and it's pretty pathetic, really, in, in terms of predictive power, so I, I no longer recommend that. Now, how could this be relevant to um, psychology? Well, what is the point of this skill? I, I think the point is, is to uh, create experiences that are seen to be required to be part of the group. So that by having these experiences, you are doing your proper function in the group. Now, when, when you're in a psychology experiment, there are, um, social demands suggested to you about what is appropriate behavior, namely the demand characteristics of the experiment. And it's very clear to subjects typically, at least I think it is, at least there'll be some demand characteristics, whether it's what the experimenter was thinking of or not, about what is the appropriate way to respond in this situation. And so it would be all too, all too natural for a subject, particularly high in phenomenological control, to construct those experiences to satisfy the demands of being a good subject. And this was pointed out by Martin Orne in the late 50s and 60s. And Martin Orne was a hypnosis researcher and he coined the term demand characteristics to understand what was happening in hypnosis situations. 
But the term was so useful, it took off and has now become part of general psychology, but that in fact grew out of um, the hypnotic literature of the, especially 1960s. One thing that's often missed, um, people took, took Orne's idea and thought demand characteristics means something like response bias. Somebody just says it to please you. Yeah, that's one way demand characteristics can be satisfied. The subject can say, well, I could push it a bit more that way without being, you know, it seems still fair enough. It's just sort of response bias. It's not reflecting genuine experience necessarily. But Orne himself, um, maybe he didn't say it very often, but when you look through his early papers, you find him saying, no, this could actually be genuine experience that the person has constructed. And I think once you grasp that point, a lot of the way people deal with demand characteristics becomes unconvincing in terms of people think, if I show this isn't response bias, if there's some, say, some real neurophysiological uh, evidence for the subjective effects the subjects are saying, this can't be demand characteristics. No, that's wrong. It could be demand characteristics. Because the only way people construct these subjective experiences is by create transforming the neural and physiological underpinnings that constitute those subjective experiences. Uh, an Irving Kirshner paper asked early on, um, well, earlier than we did, um, what does this mean for psychology? So that's what I'd like to look at. So this is the, the general claim. People routinely, and, and remember phenomenological control is widespread, uh, maybe, maybe five, ten percent of people experience can't experience any of it, but almost everyone can experience something, and um, some people experience quite dramatic sorts of experiences. They can um, uh, paralyze themselves, um, talking tongues, um, believe there are other people, and so on, by the use of phenomenological control. So, Given this is a, a widespread spread ability and an act of self-deception, surely it happens a lot without people knowing it's happening, because that's the point. So here's, here's a simple idea. How, how could we um, get a handle on the extent to which it's happening? Take a phenomenon which you might think is phenomenological control. So for me, if I thought about talking in tongues in the church, I'd think that's likely phenomenological control. The spirit descends on you, you start babbling away. Uh, it seems to you that you're doing that because the spirit descends on you. Um, it, that helps you fit in with the group. It bonds group membership. It consolidates your belief and the group's beliefs. Everything feels good. So if you took a measure of the extent to which people spoke in tongues, and then you re regressed it on phenomenological control, then to the extent it's produced by phenomenological control, as phenomenological control ability goes to zero, then talking in tongues should go to zero. And as phenomenological control increases, talking in tongues should increase. That's the idea. And um, you could say some phenomena may not be all phenomenological control. Um, in fact, there might be very good bases for that phenomenon happening for quite other reasons, but it gets boosted by phenomenological control when it's useful to do so. Then you should have an intercept, which is due to non-phenomenological control processes, and the slope will tell you by how much extra effect is produced by one unit increase in phenomenological control. So you get a sense of the relative amounts of the effect due to phenomenological control and other processes. Now, there is a, a methodological problem here I want to introduce, um, which is what happens when you have error in measurement. Regression assumes uh, that the predictor variable is measured without error, a point that's often missed when people use uh, regression. Now, what happens when we introduce error in the predictor variable? You spread out the points. And when you spread out the points, the line rotates around the mean, and you introduce an intercept and flatten the slope. So of course, when we measure phenomenological control, there'll be some error. There is a way of dealing with this. Uh, Simone Malika um, has worked on, and he's working on some papers with me, um, with a Bayesian solution to that, where you can take into account the error of measurement to re reconstruct uh, what's going on. So um, I think that's interesting 
that's something we have to bear in mind. What we found in the simulation so far, as I said if you have a, before, if you have a reliability of about 0.7, this effect is not too great, um, and um, you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, she's just about to do some work looking particularly at the phenomenological control data, so we can say for sure with this particular data set what the magnitude of possible problems are and, and the Bayesian solutions I think we're looking at. But I'm just going to park that aside for a minute and um, say we, we'll come to it, but it looks like um, not a problem. What I want to do is to sort of validate the notion empirically with a sort of a positive control, namely uh, I'll regress each phenomenological control item onto the rest of the phenomenological control scale and see if it behaves like I claim it should behave. And you'll see there are some problems. So I'm going to problematize my, my, my simple advice, but then I'm going to say the problems aren't really that great. Um, and um, you'll see the degree of smear that's acceptable. Um, you'll see what I mean. So let's take, um, I'm going to go through the phenomenological control items um, from easy to hard. The easiest one is your hand is getting so heavy it's falling down, hand lowering. Now when you regress the extent of experience on that on the rest of the phenomenological control scale, you actually get fairly big intercept here. Okay. Now this could be an artifact of how the zero point is defined. You felt your arm was no more heavy than normal. Well, if you're holding your hand out like this for a long time, it is more heavy than normal. So a um, person saying one or two doesn't actually mean they responded much to the suggestion. So maybe it's that. Arm rigidity, the next one. Um, incidentally here, I'm testing whether the intercept this is a, a significant, not a significant test, a, a null hypothesis test of whether the intercept is different from zero with the base factor. So if this is, if base factor is greater than three, it means we have evidence for an intercept. If the base factor is less than a third, we have evidence for, for zero intercept. So I'm using base factors because you can't do that with significance testing. So here we do have massive evidence for an intercept, as I say, which you can see with your, with your eyes. Now, arm rigidity is the suggestion your arm is so rigid you can't bend it. Now, try and bend it. Just try and bend your arm. And the question is, can you bend your arm? Here, the intercept is reasonably small, but there is an intercept when tested against zero. But you have what, you, what I want you to notice, you have a really nice steep slope and you have a small intercept, albeit, albeit a positive one. Now, as we go through in order of suggestions difficulty, magnetic hands, the easy suggestions do have a positive intercept. Then the intercept gets to zero. Not quite sensitive evidence. Um, or very small. Then as we get, uh, so that should be mean score, as we get to the more difficult suggestions, um, experiencing a mosquito being there, the intercept actually becomes negative, just slightly negative. Okay. Now, for example, hallucinating music, it makes sense that there would be a negative intercept because to create hallucinations, requires greater phenomenological control skill than to create magnetic hands. So some items are more difficult than others. So it makes sense in order to begin to experience those difficult items, you really need some phenomenological control ability. So I think then the intercept seen in that way, you see it's an artifact of averaging together easier and hard items. When you average together a scale in easier and hard items, you're going to get a negative intercept for the hard items and a positive intercept for the easy items. And that's, it's as simple as that. But notice the intercepts, what we have are steep slopes and small intercepts either way. So when in the, what follows, I show a phenomenon and has some intercept, maybe we, we shouldn't take some intercept terribly seriously. What matters is if there's a steep slope and there's a small intercept, that could well be all phenomenological control. Does that make sense? I don't know if you've seen, so here's the first phenomenon we're going to deal with. This is visually evoked auditory, auditory response. Do you hear any sounds as these objects crash into each other? Going. Yeah. So this is um, this is the effect. If you hear sounds, this is a visually evoked auditory response, and this was 
uh, Lisa De Bruyne had a, a, this Twitter example and um, uh, got some responses on it. So sort of doing the rounds. These are the materials that um, Ryan programmed up for um, uh, testing where sort of abstract images clashing, I guess. And the question is, do you hear sounds? And then this is what happens um, when you plot subjects uh, ratings of auditory sensation to no auditory sensation, zero to five, which happens to be on the same zero to five scale of PCS, basically. We get um, lovely steep slope. This is phenomenological control with uh, intercept of zero, evidence for actual zero intercept. So uh, I would say this particular phenomenon, which the, the paper's on, and was going around and was argued to do with um, various psychological processes, um, is most simply explained as the use of phenomenological control. And that's end of story. I don't know if you've heard of aut autonomic sensory meridian response. So this was um, this started just a few years ago. Someone on a chat group said when they uh, something like when people fold towels, or rub things gently, they get a tingling in the scalp. It goes down towards the neck, and it's and it's rather pleasant. Um, so then. Um, um, people started saying, oh, yes, I get that, and it became a thing. And so there's tons of videos now on YouTube um, saying they're autonomic sensory meridian response videos. Um, in one or two years ago, it was the number two YouTube, YouTube search term in the US. I mean, there are a ton of, if you want to search for a ton of videos, and they're rather weird things to watch. <laughs> Just a few months ago, I decided to watch them through to see what it was. And what you have is um, uh, someone talking, uh, whispering in a very sort of so intimate way to you while stroking a microphone or, or, or pretending to stroke your hair like this, a sort of a, a sort of a mock intimacy uh, type of thing. It's almost um, semi-erotic type of, uh, but it's incredibly popular. So, um, but it also the interesting thing is about the, the range of strange things that trigger it, slow movements, folding towers, whispering, lead to a specific, a very specific set of reactions. So this struck us as just a sort of thing that could be phenomenological control. Once a sort of an idea comes about, you meant to have these experiences in a certain situation, well, some people will create those experiences. But the trouble is they become very offended if you say you're making it yourself. Because the point of phenomenological control is precisely it doesn't seem to you making it yourself. So uh, Ryan programmed this up and um, we had students write um, the intensity of the um, tingling, fre the frequency that produced scalp, frequency of the videos that produced scalp tingling, and whether it was pleasant or calm. And this is what you get. You get these lovely steep lines with intercepts. Uh, we don't actually have Bayesian evidence of the zero, but you can see whatever they are, they're really pretty small intercepts uh, with lovely steep lines. So for me, um, the simplest explanation is this sort of atomic, autonomic meridian sensory response is um, phenomenological control. Now we didn't get it on calm and pleasantness. So the relationship of calm and pleasantness to phenomenological control was reasonably flat. But the advocates of this experience say calm and pleasantness is a key part of the experience. But when you look at the instructional material, uh, the demand characteristics for calm and pleasantness are far weaker. I think for ethical reasons, they say, uh, it is likely you enjoy some of these vi videos, being partial to others, and even dislike one or two. Some of the scenes might make you feel uncomfortable. If you do feel uncomfortable with any of the videos, feel, feel free to drop out of question. So, you know, that sort of thing you say in ethics. But that changes the demand characteristics. And it no longer makes calm and pleasantness a key part of the demands. 
And so I think it makes perfect sense that those experiences no longer strongly correlate with phenomenological control. But we didn't want to say everything is phenomenological control. I mean, those results to me are so striking. Uh, it seemed important to have things which are experiences, compelling experiences, so in some sense similar, um, which are, are not produced by phenomenological control as, as part of the package of what we're talking about. So one we thought about was more the liar, where lines look longer or shorter depending on whether the diagonal lines point outward or inward. Um, it's debated what causes it, but let's say um, that it's something to do with the visual system trying to reconstruct the causes of that experience and is done internally within the, the visual system. So it's trying to infer the, the um, uh, what would cause perceptions of these lines like this and therefore infer likely lengths. So that needn't have anything to do with phenomenological control. So the way we did this um, was we had a reference line um, and a comparison line which was shorter or longer and the subject had to say which line was longer, which horizontal line is longer. Uh, now we introduced, you might say, um, there's always scope for a response bias in the previous experiments. You just have to say yes more often and you'll get a higher score and say five more often. So we introduced that in the Muller Lyle case as well, in the sense that the proportion of trials where the reference line is judged to be longer than the comparison line is the measure. Okay. Proportion greater than 0.5 indicates the direction of bias, particularly from Muller Lyle. So here we go. So with Muller Lyle, with every um, uh, opportunity for response bias to show itself, the Muller Lyle illusion is strong but flat with a high intercept. We didn't pick up any relationship to phenomenological control. So nicely, phenomenological control doesn't explain everything. Another um, um, paradigm that has been used and has had more um, impact in psychology than the ones we're dealing with is rubber hand illusion. You hide the person's hand in a box, you have a rubber hand, and you stroke the rubber hand and the real hand uh, with brushes, or you tap them synchronously, um, and ask the person, did the rubber hand feel like their own hand? And um, you can get the effect build up even after something like 10 seconds. You're normally done for a minute, but you can get 10 seconds, experience in under 10 seconds. The person says, oh yeah, the rubber hand feels like mine. And this is often given a Bayesian model uh, where you have a prior probability of the rubber hand uh, of, of the two hands really being the same in some sense, being uh, a common cause for the tactile sensations and the visual, visual uh, sensation you have of the stroking of the rubber hand. Now, I find that model rather implausible. My prior probability of a rubber hand being my own hand is essentially zero. I don't really think in 10 seconds I'm going to change that probability much at all by someone tapping it. But that's, that's the existing theory. There's another possibility. Subjects recognize what is meant to experience and they construct that experience in order to satisfy what the experimenter wants without knowing that they're doing that because they're being a good subject. And indeed, <clears throat> when you regress, I felt the rubber hand was my hand. Again, this was um, hypnotizability was done a few years ago. People with zero <coughs> phenomenological control or hypnotic hypnotizability disagree with the statement on average that the rubber hand is their own. And you only get agreement once you've got some capacity for phenomenological control. This is an average over several statements. You can also um, measure what's called proprioceptive drift, where the person points to where they think their actual hand is. You see if it's drifted towards the rubber hand. And again, what you find is um, um, an intercept of very close to zero. We don't quite have Bayesian evidence for zero. For when phenomenological control is zero, you essentially get close, at least close to zero and possibly zero drift. With a fairly, I know it doesn't look 
<clears throat> like a steep slope here when you look at the absolute magnitude. Uh, um, one unit increase in hypnotic response gives you more than half a centimetre increase in drift. And bear in mind, the total average drift is only one centimetre. So that's a huge effect of phenomenological control on the experience of the rubber hand by either direct or indirect measures. Now, there is a problem with all those studies. Um, <clears throat> they were done in the same context, meaning the phenomenological control, the hypnotic response was measured in the same session as the rubber hand, the via, uh, and so on, the other things that we talked about. Now that creates demand characteristics in itself, because the subject is asking themselves, why are we testing this in the same session? So you can construct relationships, you can bring about relationships between variables simply by testing them in the same session. I still think the strength of the relationships that we see there um, is a uh, unnerving case for anyone who wants to say it's not phenomenological control, but still uh, better practice is in different contexts. So here's some effects in different contexts. One is mirror touch synesthesia. Namely, <clears throat> if you see videos of someone being touched, do you feel the touch on yourself? So this um, <clears throat> is data, a database that Jamie Ward had built up, which we could coordinate with our hypnosis database. And because they were done, constructed at, for different purposes at different times, they never meant, no way would the subjects ever know that they were contextually related because they weren't until we decided just to to uh, match up the names and see what we got. And here, um, the, the mirror touch synesthesia response um, has this nice steep slope with an intercept of close to zero, although not Bayesian evidence for zero. Um, so mirror touch synesthesia may be a construction completely of phenomenological control. Vanessa Botan, a student of Jamie Ward, also had a vicarious pain database. They mean, <clears throat> if, you, if you see a video of someone being hurt, do you feel pain yourself? Now, this is a fairly difficult suggestion in that only 10, 20% of people experience that. Now, when we coordinate this database out of context with the our hypnotizability database, we get a nice steep slope, but with an intercept above zero for number of pain responses. Now, this intercept above zero is more interesting to me because I say this is a difficult suggestion. Only 10, 20 percent of people experience it. So that means you expect a negative intercept based on the considerations I said before. So that means I think there is a, a part of the caris pain that is not due to phenomenological control. I, I do take this intercept seriously for the reasons I just stated. But there is another part which is about the same size we have a unit increase in phenomenological control, you'll get about the same size increase in, in uh, the vicarious pain. So it could well be that some people um, have vicarious pain for reasons un unrelated to phenomenological control. Um, but those same people or other people might boost that experience because it suits their self-perception of a compassionate person, for example. Now, so far I've talked about uh, phenomena in the lab, and of course they're interesting from a psychology perspective. And I think demand characteristics and phenomenal control has been underappreciated generally in psychology and there's a lot of work we're looking forward to do to looking at how this plays out across many paradigms. But in some sense, the real interest is in everyday life and well, lab experiments are part of everyday life, a funny sort of everyday life for some people. Uh, another funny part of everyday life for some people is uh, meditation experiences, which I was interested in. Um, and there are, there are some states of, there are some medita medita meditative practices within the Buddhist tradition, absorption states, jhana states, which have distinctive phenomenology that not many people achieve. So I was intrigued by them as, are these possible examples of phenomenological control? So now what happens in jhana is um, you uh, temporarily remove what are called the hindrances to being properly mindful and um, engaging in a flourishing way, 
both with life and your current meditative practice. And those hindrances are craving something, ill will, feeling lazy and tired, worry and restlessness, and, and doubting the, that the procedure works. So what you do is you, you first temporarily remove the hindrances, various practices of doing that, and then you start concentrating, say, on your breath. And in the first state, your mind uh, becomes distraction-free where you just have breath, the, the joy of uh, joy and physical pleasure um, arising from the hindrances disappearing, and you can use thinking to help you concentrate. In the next state, the thinking drops out, and you have breath, joy, and physical pleasure derived just from concentrating. Uh, and then you start to calm down, and the physical pleasure that pervades your body um, due to engaging in meditation drops out. And there's sort of a, a joy fills your body and there's just joy and breath. And then finally, there's just a state of equanimity where you don't hold on to cling to anything. There's not even joy or disjoy. There's, there's just what you're concentrating on. So that's the jhana experience. So some people say there's arguments about exactly what this experience is constituted by. This is a particular rendition of it. Um, and some people say you need many, many sustained hours day after day, maybe for years in order to experience these properly. So what I did was to take some roughly 19 year old undergraduates, never experienced meditation with jhana before. And um, we suggested to them the removal of the hindrances. And then we suggested they would experience each of these. So the mind will be concentrating just on these factors that are meant to be part of jhana, and then we'll remove one at a time to reduce the success of jhanas. So the question is, can we construct the jhanas by suggestion? Now, this is the removal of the hindrances. And this is um, pre-suggestion, the amount of hindrances they experience. Post-suggestion, removal of the hindrances. And um, the main thing to notice here is really pretty noisy. Uh, and removing hindrances just by telling people you do not feel craving anymore turns out to be more difficult than I thought. Um, but I'm not a clinical psychologist, so perhaps I should have realized that just telling people you're feeling great now isn't as easy as all that. But what you can do is look at some interesting individuals. And for particular people there, we did achieve the effect. So that was the amount of hindrances they felt beforehand. We suggest the removal, and it stays removed for these people. Time spent thinking words, but we can look at the particular individuals. Um, words, words, remove the words, and the words are mainly gone. So it's thinking of words, remove the words, words are mainly gone. And then so on for the other, bodily pleasure is there, remove the bodily pleasure, and it's gone for these people. Joy, joy is there, remove the bodily, remove the joy, and the joy is gone, just concentrating on breath. So if you look at particular individuals, we can get something that um, approximates jhana. I'm not saying it's real jhana. But people can construct, at least some people can construct these experiences. I think that raises an interesting question about how you distinguish that from real jhana. Okay. So, phenomenal control, I think, is caused by intending to move, image, or pretend while being unaware of those intentions. The intending to do it makes it fit with your plans and goals. The being unaware of your intentions is what makes it an act of self-deception that feels like it's happening by itself. What is the relationship to that of placebo, which is another common sort of suggestion effect? Well, placebo is where the expectation of an experience causes that experience. The expectation of pain relief directly causes pain relief. So it's not necessarily the same thing. Placebo might be something more specific than that. Evans had this interesting book where he thought placebo was specifically uh, a dampening down of the, of the first stage, the acute phase response of the immune system, uh, which causes generalized inflammation in a sort of a more specific way. So anything that is produced by inflammation, which you would include as uh, depression, for example, some arguments for that, uh, as well as pain, um, that can be uh, fixed by placebo because what happens is you're told there is social support now you don't need to restrict your movements you can start doing things and and switching to a new phase of, of of healing because if you get into trouble there's people there to look after you now if placebo i don't know where that theory stands i thought that was interesting it's a very specific mechanism i mean if placebo is that is not phenomenological control 
it's something rather more specific and interesting. So just because an effect is, is, a, is caused by suggestion, it doesn't mean it's the same as phenomenological control. On the other hand, when you look at some placebo studies, one has to wonder. So this is a shot I took from a talk by Evan Kirsch a couple of months ago, where he's looking at open placebos. You can tell people these are placebos and say, take this placebo. And the evidence is that works. So then uh, this uh, Niels Bagge uh, thought, why don't we just get people to imagine taking placebo pills? And that works great too. But now we're in the realm of phenomenological control, I believe. This is what phenomenological control is. It's constructing imaginations in order to create experiences in yourself. And it's quite clear what the demand characteristics are. Is that all placebo is? Well, here's a study by Benedetti where uh, with real patients who had tubes in them and um, sometimes they're given hidden morphine through the tubes and sometimes they were told they're getting morphine and when you're told you're getting morphine you get a bigger response now is that phenomenological control i was less sure about that um it didn't strike me so obvious as phenomenological control why why you would use it in that maybe you do i don't know but it strikes me placebo is an interesting mixed bag where some of the paradigms will probably be due to phenomenal control and some of the paradigms might well be due to something else. With a, um, a conditioning paradigm, uh, Parsons et al. Uh, correlated phenomenal control, the hypnotic response of placebo energies and, and got a good relationship. So at least in some, some studies, placebo is phenomenal control, but I think that's a really open question, interesting question, the extent to which it is or isn't. Now, so far, I've just told you, I've shown you, I've given you a causal theory and I presented you with correlational data. And you say, but obviously correlational data has many in principle other explanations. But what I want to say is in all these cases, we have independent evidence for the causal direction going in the direction I state. So auditory hallucinations, we know we can create with suggestion. That the, the, the part of the knowledge control scale, auditory hallucinations. So VIA is is naturally explained by that already existing causal pathway. Tactile sensations are part of phenomenal control scale already, is one of the suggestions. Um, you can, in terms of embodiment, the rubber hand illusion, it's not the phenomenal control scale, but you can suggest the highly hypnotizable out of the body experiences and create out of the body experiences in them. We know we can create just much bigger distortions in embodiment than the rubber hand by giving suggestions to um, people high in phenomenal control. An increase and decrease pain is dime a dozen in the literature, in the hypnotic suggestion literature. So in terms of the caris pain and placebo effect, we know that causal direction goes in the direction I'm stating. So to summarize, phenomenal control may be a pervasive way in which demand characteristics in the lab or everyday life are turned into subjective experience, convincing the participant and others of the reality of phenomenon may in fact be wholly constructed by the way the situation is presented. All right, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alton. Um, does anybody have any questions, either here or uh, on Zoom? Yeah. So thank you, that, that was really clear and, and very, very interesting. Um, and I, I mean, I know you've been talking to people that, that use these paradigms as part of their research. Or, mm. um, and so I understand now your perspective, but if you were to, to be using rubber hand illusion and not want to sort of jack in all your research today, I mean, what, presumably some people don't think this matters. No. And why don't they think it matters? Okay. So as, you, as soon as you say demand characteristics, um, people get upset, tables are thumped, feelings are hurt. Um, and I think that's a pity. I, I, I think one, one reaction people have is they think, oh, you're making a silly 101 methodological error. But that, is, that, isn't, that isn't exactly what we're saying. Because when you say demand characteristics, you think, well, of course, we take that into account. We're proper scientists, right? And it's not as if they haven't thought about it. But the, the little thing that people hadn't thought about was that demand characteristics can, can result in genuine changes in experience and underlying physiology. And once you take that into board, it becomes a new theory. So what, we, what we're offering is a simple general theory. 
So we're not just making methodological critique, we're saying there's a new theory here, a simple, powerful general theory. Now, of course, when some Johnny come lately comes along and says there's a simple, powerful general theory, people don't like that either necessarily. So uh, what do they say? Rubber hand is where there's been most kickback. People have big grants, lots of money on the line, decades of career, they feel on the line. I think the proper response is to say, well, that's an interesting new theory. How can we test it? That's a scientific response. Now, um, they have thought about demand characteristics. And one thing they often do is have, this is a synchronous condition. You can have an asynchronous stroking condition, which produces less of an effect. You get a, a pretty much parallel line down here. Um, so you say, well, let's take the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. Doesn't that control for demand characteristics? You see, because it's parallel going up here. Well, we looked at this in our um, first, first study. Um, subjects expect strongly the synchronous condition to give a stronger effect than the asynchronous. So there are demand characteristics for that, strong demand characteristics for that, for that synchronicity difference. And I think the high and low phenomenal control subjects respond to those demand characteristics to within the limits of honesty. So the lows respond to it to, with different degrees of disagreement. And the highs respond to it with different degrees of agreement. So that only the highs actually construct an experience that they can agree with. So that so I um, I think the demand characteristics problem in the rubber hand illusion has not been solved. I think it's a problem. I mean, one of the things I was going to say uh, about this, I mean, there are other conditions in the rubber hand illusion as well. So one is, for example, if you've just got a rubber hand in front of you yeah. and you don't stroke it, yeah. people don't report the illusion, but they do get proprioceptive drift. So you do have these things that pull apart, and that has nothing to do with phenomenological control because uh, people who are high in phenomenological control don't get more drift than those who don't. It's just a, a ubiquitous I'm, effect. Sorry, in that that's one of them. The other thing is about demand characteristics. What people would say is that you've got a prior of synchronous things being caused together. And that is just another way of stating demand characteristics. There is a, a kind of another theoretical stance on it, that, that things that happen together in time are causally related. And, and that you could call it demand characteristics. You could call it um, you know, a sensory prior. And it's the same difference. Yeah, to go back to the, uh, remember with phenomenological uh, Proprioceptive drift, it's the highs that show the proprioceptive drift. And when you, um, you, you can get um, a rubber hand illusion with no touching at all, just with what you'd think would be control experiments, like a laser light going over the hands. So there's no synchronous touching at all, or just stroking over the hand without touching it, creating a, what was described in the Urson lab as a sort of a magnetic feeling, which is exactly like the magnetic hands suggestion. So I think what subjects do is they react to the sets of conditions they're presented with in the experiment to determine what is the feeling of ownership they should be feeling, given the conditions that are presented to them. And given their lifetime of history, that things that happen together in time tend to be caused together, you know, and, and that's the thing that you won't kind of put in there that you want to get a rip uh, away with, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, when you when you ask people, uh, so Peter's done the experiment where you you don't present them with the actual stimulation, you describe the experiment, so we call it an expectation experiment. Subjects strongly expect precise pattern results you get in the rubber hand illusion. So the difference between synchrony and asynchrony, including the difference in the rate of response to the different questions about the subjective experiences that you will be experiencing. So I think that really needs to be dealt with before you can make anything more out of it. 
the demand characteristics. Well, it's like just saying that you expect the sun to come from above, you know, and that that's a demand characteristic. It's just your history of how the world works. It, it, it's odd to label light from above as a demand characteristic, and that's exactly what you're doing here with the rubber hand illusion. Yeah, if you, if you, um, if you, let's say we ask people, would you get angry in a certain situation? And people say, yes, they would. You say, strong demand characteristics. And it might be because they would get angry in that situation. So that's right. So there, there can be genuine mechanisms by which something comes about. But then what would happen if you regressed the extent of anger in that situation on phenomenological control? You get a big intercept. Because there would be something left over that's produced not by phenomenological control. Okay, shall we? There's uh, one more question from uh, David Booth. Uh, David, do you want to uh, ask your question? Uh, yes, I um, we had this discussion very briefly before with you. Um, yeah. I have a David. problem. Am I audible? Am I audible? Just, Just yeah. yeah. I'll try and get nearer and speak louder. <laughs> um, I have a problem with the basic idea that you can intend something without being aware of, of the intending. Um, and at least for the uh, phenomena in which, as you mentioned in passing, we have some sort of physiological um, possibility, um, like the classical items in the classical scales, um, and perhaps as you were just arguing, uh, some aspects of the rubber hand. Um, I uh, think that it's attention that is the core direction of attention, that is the core of the phenomena, that um, attention is distracted from the usual intended, uh, usual sub physiological and other um, sub processes involved in an action. So, uh, but people are willing for the effect. And you seem to be referring to intention just to allow for the fact that people are, are cooperating. Um, and uh, whether you could um, attribute the phenomena to the direction of attention is the question I'm asking without making a core to the mechanism, the actual mechanism. Uh, an intention. I'm not, sorry, I'm not sure I caught. Did anyone catch it? Yes. I'm not, sorry, I'm not, I didn't quite. Um, well, we'll were you saying that there's a motivational issue? That people, uh, people need to be willing? I, I take you to be saying, you said um, that uh, it's an effect. The, the, effect you're talking about is having is a result of an intention which is not aware that the intender is not aware of and uh, you know to have an intention you know is to have reasons for doing something and i'm not at all sure about reasons that are are you saying it's it's not possible to have intentions you're not aware of i i can't i'm not having difficulty making sense of the idea And, and what do you say about the alternative theory that the core is a is a direction of attention, a, a distraction from the normal background to the intention by um, the, the effect of being of being being cooperative. It's not that cooperative is a condition. It's not a mediation. Attention shift is a, a distraction. Is the uh, mediating process. So you're just not coming across loudly enough. Um, I'm sorry. I'll, um, is anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I think, um, yeah I, 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 I'm sorry, David. It's very hard to hear you. And um, I'm not sure. We, uh, I don't think there are any other questions, but I think we should probably wrap up anyway. We'll leave it. Sorry, sorry about perhaps, that. Perhaps you guys can, can, yeah. can talk offline about this and, and you can ask your question either by email to Zoltan or, or 
Yes, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and uh, yes, there won't be another CNI next week because of the strikes. Um, and I will update people on the next one. And thank you again, Zoltan, for an excellent, fascinating talk. Thanks. Was that recorded?